All right. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to start off by just giving a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, if you have a question today, uh, we ask that you use the Q&A function that is located in the Zoom panel. I'm sure we're all familiar with that at this point. Um, also, if you have any technical issues or want to chat with others within uh, that are participating today, please use the chat function for that. Uh, everyone's going to be on mute today except for uh, those of us who are presenting. My name is Tim Hines. I'm the Executive Director of the University Economic Development Association, and I'm pleased to uh, be with you today. Uh, just uh, first of all, a brief overview of who UEDA is. So UEDA is the University Economic Development Association. What we do is we connect our members, uh, which consist of higher education institutions, private sector businesses, and economic development organizations to resources that facilitate economic growth within their communities. Uh, success in our modern economy is about innovation and entrepreneurship. It's about fostering talent in young people from preschool through, through their entire lives. And it's about developing a sense of place. And that's really what UEDA focuses on are the intersections of that talent, innovation, and place. And uh, we do that through our higher education networks uh, and those allies of our higher ed professionals uh, throughout. Never before has academia, the private sector, and economic stakeholders been so reliant on one another to create economic opportunity, and in this case, prosperity. And our members are working together to expand uh, that opportunity of leveraging talent innovation in place, recognizing the interconnections of each of these elements. So I would like to, uh, to start today uh, by introducing our speaker, uh, Christopher Thornburg. Uh, Chris works for Beacon Economics. Uh, Beacon Economics is an independent research and consulting firm that's dedicated to delivering accurate, insightful, and objectively bought uh, objectively based economic analysis and it enables its clients to make informed decisions about investment, growth, revenue, and policy. And a little bit about Chris. Uh, Chris founded Beacon Economics back in 2006 and under his leadership the firm has become one of the most respected research organizations in California uh, and throughout the nation, serving public and private sector clients uh, across the United States. In 2015, Dr. Thornburg also became director of the UC Riverside School of, uh, of Business Center for Economic Forecasting and Development and an adjunct professor at the school. An expert in economic and revenue forecasting, regional economics, economic policy, and labor and real estate markets, Dr. Thornburg has consulted for private industry, cities, counties, and public agencies, and he became nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage market crash that began in 2007 as one of few economists on record to predict the global economic recession that followed. Dr. Thornburg holds a BA of economics from the Anderson School at uh, UCLA and a BS degree in business administration uh, from, uh, I believe it's SUNY Buffalo, right? SUNY Buffalo, yeah, actually I have a PhD from UCLA. Oh, but, thank uh, you, thank you. That part was cut <laughs> off, so I appreciate that. So right. I'll let Chris take over the slides from here and uh, please join me in welcoming Chris and throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A and we'll have time for those at the very end. Absolutely, and uh, good a good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Uh, I do realize these are certainly interesting times, and uh, I was asked by UADA to come in and uh, chat a little bit about our outlook for the economy. Um, these are certainly interesting times. Um, I will say that while I predicted the Great Recession, I think quite well, uh, I will also be honest and say uh, I, like a lot of economists, uh, uh, we're not anticipating, of course, uh, a 2020 recession uh, based on a pandemic, but that's exactly where we're at. Uh, and of course, the big question is, uh, what's this recession going to look like? As is typical in these sort of circumstances, uh, this has devolved into a letter game. Uh, is it the U, the V, the L, the W, or any of the uh, other sort of letters and or shapes that people want to use to describe what's going on out there? Now, it is, of course, uh, as already noted, um, uh, certainly uh, interesting times. Uh, in fact, I remember just a couple months ago talking about uh, our economic outlook for the economy. And, you know, candidly, for the last number of years, we've been fairly bullish on things. Um, and indeed, February of this year, we were still uh, fairly comfortable that the U.S. expansion could continue. But even then, we noted that the top risk uh, both globally and here inside the United States, was the coronavirus. 
Um, of course, our greatest fears have indeed come true, uh, and we continue to uh, wrestle to get the uh, virus fully under control here inside the United States. Now, I'm not going to, of course, uh, bore you with the statistics uh, on the virus itself. In fact, uh, I would argue in many ways it's kind of sucked all the oxygen out of the room. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's much conversation on, on anything nowadays except the virus. Um, for us, of course, the question isn't about what's going on right now, but where does this head? How much damage will occur? Um, how rapid or lack or not rapid will the recovery be? Now, if you're sort of paying attention to the conversations that are happening out there, uh, you probably are also aware that the majority of the opinions is that this is going to be a U-shaped downturn uh, or perhaps a Nike swoosh, that's the other uh, term for it. Uh, but what we're talking about, of course, is a protracted period of time where the U.S. economy is unable to perform uh, at capacity. Uh, and of course, a couple examples of this are given to your right. Uh, on the left, uh, I'm sorry, on the right-hand side in the bottom, uh, that's the real GDP forecast that comes from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, and again, you could see how grim they're looking. They're talking about uh, a pretty phenomenal decline in economic output, close to 10%, uh, continuing to decline through the third quarter before we finally start growing again. And they're not seeing U.S. output uh, get back to fourth quarter of 2019 levels into the end of next year. Uh, to put this in context, uh, the Great Recession, we only saw about a 5.5% decline in overall output. Um, so they're talking about uh, an, uh, an, uh, a, a recession significantly worse than the Great Recession. And to be clear, that was the worst downturn since the Great Depression. So you're talking really, truly negative sort of outlook here. Very similar with the UBS uh, unemployment forecast. You're talking double digits to the end of this year and unemployment not getting back to normal levels until the end of 2022. So grim, no doubt about it. But it's also worth noting that when it comes to any kind of conversation about the economy, hysteria has been the new normal. It's as simple as that. And I appreciate how scary the current circumstances are, but I'll also remind everybody that it was only a short 15 months ago in January 2019 where the stock market was down by 20%. Uh, and of course, 75% uh, of the economists who contributed to the Wall Street Journal Next Recession Survey were saying we were gonna have a recession by this year. Why? Of course, back then it was because interest rates were on the rise and that's because inflation was creeping into the system because we had a Chinese trade war that was gonna ruin US manufacturing and let's not forget the real estate collapse that was already underway. As we, of course, know, 2019 was a perfectly fine year. None of these things occurred. Uh, and really, honestly, these fears were hyperbolic, to say the least. Today, obviously, we are in a recession. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But putting that to one side, while this is clearly the most significant negative shock to hit the U.S. economy in the last 10 to 15 years, um, the hysteria, the over-the-top pessimism, the claims of doom and gloom have simply grown proportionately. So I would caution everybody to take a step back uh, and, and think through this before you leap to the conclusion that this is truly going to be as bad as the talking heads uh, seem to be telling us. Now, to put this in context, to have some sense of why we're not quite as pessimistic as most folks, we first need to talk a little bit about why we had a great recession. Um, Back then, uh, the Great Recession was driven not by the short-term collapse of real estate, but really by what happened over the previous six years. Between 2001 and 2007, the United States was subject to one of the greatest Ponzi schemes in, in global financial history. And of course, I'm talking about the subprime finance scam, innovation, whatever you want to call it. But $15 trillion of borrowing happened in the U.S. economy between 2001 and 2007, um, uh, basically pushed forward by the false narrative that you could make bad debt, uh, roll it up and sell it off in asset-backed securities, and, and basically protect uh, investors. Uh, that wasn't the case, as, as we know. But what happened, of course, while that money was pouring into the economy, is parts of the U.S. economy became dangerously... Um, uh, over expanded. Now, of course, much of that was wrapped around all this money pouring into American households. 
the housing market, of course, was front and center on that, both in terms of the massive increases in, in home prices, but also, of course, the massive oversupply of homes during that particular cycle. Uh, but it wasn't just the housing market. Of course, the finance industry became ex overextended on the basis of all this money they were making in the short term, and perhaps most significantly, consumer spending uh, uh, began to grow uh, candidly to levels that were clearly not sustainable as a result of, of what consumers uh, thought about as, as free credit and unending supply of home equity. Uh, and of course, in the midst of that massive amount of consumer spending, the US trade deficit widened to 6% of GDP, which we had never seen before. Um, now, when all that money finally stopped pouring into the US economy, when it finally became apparent um, that there was no safety here, investors ran away, the, the, the subprime bubble collapsed, and, and everything started to fall apart really in early 07. Of course, by 2008, things had really hit, hit bottom. The housing market was in full collapse. Millions of jobs in construction, real estate, and finance, and retail were lost and lost permanently. And that, of course, ushered in the Great Recession. Uh, it was a very rough period of time. It was a six-quarter recession, but it, it seriously took six years for the US economy to actually get back to what we call long-run levels of production. It was a very, very nasty business cycle. Now, the hey, Chris, can you uh, swap your display so that it's full screen? We got one question about that, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, how's that? No, it's done at swap. Um, up, hmm. up on the top bar, there's swap screen. Uh, do slideshow view show, view show again. Um, uh, you go ahead, hit that. How's that? And then swap, swap displays, see where it says up at the top? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, got it. How's that? That's much better, thank you. Ah, okay. sorry, to, sorry, to ruin, sorry to ruin your flow. No, 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 not at all, I, I appreciate that. Now, when you think about the Great Recession versus today, it's easy to understand why people have leaped to the conclusion they have. I mean, take a look at the left-hand side, for example, the unemployment rate. Um, the unemployment rate only got to 10% uh, during the Great Recession. And we are already seeing an unemployment rate close to 15%. You look at something like that and it's easy to leap to the conclusion, wow, if unemployment is that high, we know it takes a long time for employment to get back to normal levels. This is gonna be a nasty cycle, no doubt about it. But take a look at that graph again. There's a couple things that should make you immediately question that simple interpretation. We have to remember that what's happening today is unlike what has happened in the past. And in this case, employment, as opposed to being a lagging indicator, is actually showing up as a leading indicator. Look when unemployment peaked during the Great Recession. It actually peaked after the Great Recession came to an end, near the end of 2009, not at the very start of the economic cycle, as the case may be. It's a different kind of business cycle. Now, the reason that this is different all boils down to how employment is showing up in the statistics. Remember, back then, during the Great Recession, em the employment losses were driven by this collapse, permanent collapse of the subprime lending bubble. This time around, it is not the consequence of some sort of other major economic problems. Quite the, quite the opposite, this is the short run economic reaction to the public health mandates that we put in place to try and get the virus under control. And on the right-hand side, you can probably see the difference between now and then much clearer. Uh, on, on the lower right-hand side, this is the data that came out last Friday, uh, having to do with the April 2020 employment report. Of course, about 22.5 million people in the United States now declare themselves as being unemployed. But the most important number here is the share of those folks who declare themselves as being on temporary layoff. In other words, people don't view these, these job losses as being permanent, the way they absolutely were back during the Great Recession. Quite the opposite, people are, are rightly understanding that what's happened here is the short-term public health mandates has simply not allowed their business to open. And while they are out of work and clearly having a tough time because they're not making any money, at the same time, 
the vast majority of them fully expect that once these public health mandates are lifted, they will go back to the job they had before. Almost 80% of people who are currently unemployed claim to be unemployed for temporary layoff reasons. We've never seen anything like this before. Now, I'm not saying all these people will indeed go back to their job, but to be clear, you cannot look at this unemployment rate. You cannot look at initial claims for unemployment and compare them to past episodes. These are not comparable circumstances. Back then, those jobs were lost permanently and it happened at the end of the downturn. This time around, it's actually the driving force and driven simply by these public health mandates. So again, this is not a typical business cycle and the lessons of the recent past are simply not, not applicable, period. And everybody should recognize that. All these people leaping to conclusions are ignoring this incredibly important point. Now, I'm not saying this is a harmless episode. Quite the opposite. Obviously, we are in a recession. This is, this is, a, this is a downturn created by this virus and the public health mandates. However, that's a little different than saying it's going to be a very, very negative business cycle. Because while this shock is clearly very large and rapid, unlike the Great Recession where we had a permanent collapse of the subprime bubble, this time around, it's pretty clear these public health mandates are not going to be sustained. We are already loosening up. When you think about the structure of the US economy, back then there was a massive restructuring because all the parts of the economy that had been overextended because of the subprime bubble simply had to shrink down to sustainable levels. This time, I don't see any reason at all for any kind of major shift in the structure of the economy. And the job losses, as noted because of this, are not yet permanent. The way to think about it is as time goes on, because people can't earn money, because businesses can't earn revenue, that they will eventually start to feel that pain. And the more pain they feel will ultimately determine how rapid of a recovery we have back to normality. Now, how much harm will be generated? That's the big question everybody has to ask themselves. And of course, we see a broad range of potential outcomes here, depending on these five questions. How long will the shutdowns last? How deep are the closures of the economy? How healthy was the economy prior to the pandemic? What has the government done to intervene in the economy? And will there be a major shift in post-virus spending? You have to have some answer for all these questions to determine just how much damage will build up during this cycle and of course equivalently how slow the recovery will be. So let's go through these really quick at the answer to these five questions and see where we end up in terms of an answer. First of all, how long? Well, we have, well I appreciate that every single day there's yet another story talking about how we're not out of this yet and the number of cases continues to increase. True, but we also have to remember that the number of new cases is clearly falling. And we do have a guidepost here in front of us uh, from other countries who are a little bit ahead of us in terms of this pandemic cycle. China is, of course, the best example, since there was the first country to suffer through this particular circumstance. And when they showed us, it's about a three to four month cycle. And we're a little over halfway through that at this particular point in time. And indeed, if you look at some data coming out of Goldman Sachs, this is high frequency data talking about industrial activity in China, consumer spending activity in China. Again, we get back to that same, that same number, three to four months for things to get back to normal. So that's not all that long. And it certainly isn't permanent as the case may be. Three to four months, what it says is for the most part, by Q3 of this year, the economy should be pretty much up and running. Now, I'm not for a second saying this virus won't still be around, but I'm also pushing back on the idea that we need a vaccine to be able to reopen the economy. I don't think that's true. It's clear by looking at the numbers that the efforts in terms of controlling the virus are indeed helping. The number of new cases is falling and we seem to be getting back to some degree of normalcy. And while I appreciate there may be some upticks in the event of the crisis of the virus here and there, Keep in mind that there's public health officials that are building SWAT teams of investigators right now who will track down every new case, figure out where it came from, get people isolated to control it before it gets out of hand. We have to remember 
the reason this virus got so bad the first time around was because we had no idea what was going on. In February, people were already dying of the virus in the United States, as we now know. And yet at that point in time, the federal government, our president, of course, was up in front of everybody saying, there is no problem. The virus isn't an issue here. Don't worry about it. You only get one Pearl Harbor, people. You get one surprise attack. And after that, learning curves kick into place. We're much smarter now. Our behavior has changed. The ability for this virus to take off again is going to be severely curtailed. I don't see this being a major issue, short of some low probability major, muta uh, major mutation in the, particular, in, the, in the virus at this particular point in time. So Q3 seems to be where we're getting at and getting to. Now, how deep of a downturn? Well, Q1 GDP didn't tell us all that much because remember, most of the time in Q1, the economy was open for business. Yes, the last few weeks we got hit and you saw it in retail sales and industrial production, but that really isn't the question. How deep is it overall? That's important, why? Well, keep in mind, there's really two pools of people out there in the economy today. There's one pool of people who have businesses that have been forced to close, who had jobs that are no longer allowed to operate because of the public health mandates. Those people no doubt are suffering. Those businesses are no doubt suffering. But there's a big hunk of the rest of the economy that is still operating. People still are making money, but they're not allowed to spend that money. So the reason this is important is you have to think about this as a balanced sort of perspective. You have any number of people who are falling behind and that will slow the recovery, but then you have all these people who are simply not able to spend they're saving lots of money, and that's going to come out in terms of accelerated spending at the back end of this thing because of this pent-up demand. Which one of these is greater? Well, by our estimate, when we sit down and run numbers on this, overall, we look at about 10 to 12 percent of the U.S. economy being directly impacted by these public health mandates. That means 85 to 88 percent, far more of the economy, is still up and running People are still earning income. And as such, the balance of those of that pent-up demand versus true lost income, the balance is truly towards pent-up demand. Now, over time, this will start to grow. After all, we have supply chain effects. When businesses aren't buying inputs, their suppliers will start to suffer and so on and so forth. But that takes months for that to kick in. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, so we think we have time given that this is a three to four month run. And the best data we have on this balance, of course, comes from our March income numbers. Take a look at the US personal savings rate that shot up to 13.1% in March of this year. This is the second highest total on record. Uh, it's really an incredibly high number going from 8% to 13.1%. I know it doesn't sound like a lot from a percentage standpoint, but remember, personal income is three-fourths of the U.S. economy. So a five percentage point uh, swing in the savings rate ends up being something on the order of about three and a half to four percent of GDP. That's a big, big number. There is a lot of dry powder in the economy building up. The April number is going to give us a little better measure of this. But clearly right now, pent-up demand is greater than overall incomes. How healthy was the economy? Well, this has been a center point of my, my, my conversations on the economy for years. The answer is the economy is a heck of a lot healthier than people have been talking about. Remember all those claims of the recession that was going to happen because of real estate meltdowns and, and, uh, and, and inflation and all these other things? Again, that rhetoric has not been aligned with the true health of the U.S. economy. We've been growing at a decent, if not exciting, basis. Labor markets have been incredibly tight with unemployment at a 50-year low level. In fact, up to this pandemic, the biggest problem in the U.S. economy was labor shortages. For two and a half years, we've had more job openings of people looking for work. This sort of circumstance, of course, means that while some people may not go back to their same job, they are still entering, re-entering a U.S. labor market, which is short workers. And when things get back up and running, that means a lot of these folks are going to have opportunities to get back in. The savings rate, which had been in an all-time low prior to the Great Recession, was actually close to a 30-year high uh, prior to this pandemic hit. 
And be, not only were savings rates high, but because of those tight labor markets, according to the Re Atlanta wage fed, fed Wage Tracker, average real gauge gains over the last couple of years have been about 4%, median real wage gains about 2%. I appreciate this is not what's talked about in the press, but again, remember, hysteria is the new normal. Those headlines don't reflect the truth. They simply reflect some grim reality that for some reason, so many economists and so many reporters want to put forward despite the fact that an honest look at the data doesn't suggest these things are true. Um, on, a, on a financial situation, on the right-hand side, this is the financial obligations ratio. That is to say the percent of household income being spent on financial obligations. Prior to the Great Recession, an all-time high level. Prior to the pandemic, an all-time low level. A slow pace of debt accumulation combined with low with, uh, uh, with very low interest rates means that households are not burdened with a lot of debt right now, which again increases the resilience to the current problems. Now people might say, oh, that's the top 10 or top 20%, but actually take a look at the left-hand side. This is data from the Federal Reserve's uh, Survey of Consumer Finance, and it shows both the median debt payment to family income, as well as the share of households who spend over 40% of their income on, on debt. As it turns out, not only is the debt burden lower in 2016 than it was in 2007, it's significantly lower than it was back in 1998. This is not a debt burden world, and that's true across all income levels. You probably have all heard that ongoing headline over and over about how the majority of Americans can't scrape $400 together for a financial emergency. I cannot tell you how many economists have completely debunked that statement over and over, we know it is not true. Yet nevertheless, the press has turned it into conventional wisdom. Far more Americans have far more money tucked away to get through a tough time than we're willing to acknowledge. This is not, I'm not saying it's a bulletproof economy, but if you were gonna have an economy to deal with this particular situation, this is about as good of economy as you could have hoped for. As for real estate, similar sort of picture, I've heard uh, uh, Zandi uh, at Moody's suggests that 15% of homeowners could go for get foreclosed on as bad, if not worse, than the Great Recession. But again, prior to the Great Recession, U.S. American residential real estate was a disaster. Bad credit, highly overvalued, uh, unsustainable prices, uh, overbuilding, excess supply. The market was a disaster and was due to collapse. Again, this time around, no excess supply. The share of units for sale for rent near an all-time low level. Because of Dodd-Frank, over the last decade, the median credit score has been the highest it's ever been, above 750. The equity share of real estate is at an all-time high level. Again, close to a bulletproof real estate market. It isn't going to collapse because of a one-month or four-month closure of the economy due to the pandemic. Indeed, the broader debt markets are actually fairly healthy. Prior to the Great Recession, private sector debt to GDP was at an all-time high, all high level. Over the last decade, debt to GDP has been falling, not rising. And prior to the Great Recession, we already saw significant troubles, particularly in real estate debt. This time around, real estate debt was at a low, close to an all-time low delinquency. Consumer debt, close to an all-time low delinquency. C&I debt, close to an all-time low. This is incredibly healthy debt markets. They're not due for some major collapse. So why are all the hedge funds screaming that it's going to collapse? Because that's the way you get the Federal Reserve to give you trillions of dollars of bailout money. It's about strategic positioning, not true economic worries. We all have to take a step back and recognize that in this world, the squeaky wheel gets the grease and everybody's trying to be the squeakiest wheel. Well, so far, where are we? Not that long, not that deep, a healthy economy. How about the government? Well, back during the Great Recession, what they did came very late and it wasn't all that much. This time around, because we're enough before the election, a completely different conversation. I would argue in many ways, the policy situation is an overreaction. What's going on right now? Look, in one typical quarter, there are about five and a half trillion dollars of transactions in the US economy. They are lobbying 2.5 to $2.7 trillion in stimulus at a $5.5 trillion economy. That is over the top. We've never seen anything like it. 
direct payments to households, expansion of employment, both who can get it and how much you can get, business loans, economic stabilization grants to airlines, national security, important industries, and so on, local government support, $350 billion for hospitals, airport, transit systems. It's unreal. And it's not just the federal government. State governments are getting involved. The IRS is getting involved. The Federal Reserve has got involved. We have never seen such a massive reaction by public authorities um, to a crisis. Yet again, this is going to go a long way towards helping us get through this. Now, of course, there's a back end to this. What's amazing to me is in the midst of just spending money hand over fist, no one seems to be worried about the consequence. We all act like, oh, this is just free money. It's not free money. In fact, you know, this year, it's highly likely that the federal government's going to have to borrow three and a half trillion dollars. One and a half, tr one trillion of that, by the way, was money they were already going to borrow. Two and a half trillion, of course, is for the bailout. And it may get worse than that. To put this in context, we borrowed less money as a percent of GDP during World War II. Back then, millions of people were dying, fighting a global fight against fascism. Now we're dealing less than 100,000 deaths over the course of four months. In a lot of ways, I know this sounds odd, but I would argue that our policy has been way too much. And we're forgetting there's a long run here. You know, prior to this, we already had $50,000 in federal debt per person. They were due to borrow $3,000 more per person for 2020 alone before the pandemic hit. Now, of course, we're talking about the government borrowing ten to eleven thousand dollars you know we are we're already a decade away from a major fiscal crisis driven by entitlements and boomers retiring and collecting really unprecedented amounts in social security and medicare and medicaid we are now accelerating towards that crisis and yet only thing we can talk about is a very short run as if the, as if this money is just free it's not we are putting a burden on our children that candidly is immoral and no one seems to be even thinking about it as we just continue to lob more and more money at the situation. Last but not least, of course, the true pessimists out there keep saying, well, maybe that's all well and good, but everybody's gonna be afraid. No one's gonna go to a ball game. No one's ever gonna go to a restaurant. No one's gonna go to a mall because they're all gonna be terrified. This is a new normal. Well, again, this isn't a new normal. Have you ever heard of polio, smallpox, the plague, the black death? Uh, the measles, mumps, I can go through a litany of pandemics humans have dealt with. And even in more recent times, such as Ebola, MERS, SARS, and even terrorism in countries like Israel, all these episodes represent circumstances by yes, by which yes, there is a chance, a higher than normal chance of something happening to you. But with that in mind, not one of these episodes in the past has ever led to some sort of massive permanent change in consumer behavior. When things have gotten better, people have gone out and lived their lives. It's as simple as that. This is not a new normal, and people need to stop calling it that. Now, I appreciate it's a new normal for us. We've been very lucky that for the past 40 years, public health officials have largely stayed in front of these kind of problems. But really, all said and done, these problems have never truly gone away. Epidemiology has been warning us for years about this. And perhaps, perhaps we're a little lucky. Because my personal feeling is when all said and done and we take a look back, we're going to realize a lot more people had this virus than we actually knew. And candidly, many of them didn't even show signs of it. In other words, if this was going to be a lesson that yes, pandemics are still part of human existence and we need to be prepared for it, this was probably a good lesson for us to learn from. Because had this thing been truly, truly bad like MERS, SARS, or Ebola, uh, the kind of catastrophe, the global economy, the global uh, a population would have say, uh, suffered uh, is beyond imagining. So let's stop talking about this being a new normal and let's just be a little smarter. So wrapping it up, look, the long run still matters. This isn't the end of the world. Is this a recession? Yeah. Is it a very sharp down? Absolutely. But will probably almost assuredly be an incredibly rapid recovery on the back end. Again, go through it. Relatively short, not that deep, the economy was really healthy. The government is over responding. And of course, there's no reason to think people are going to change their lives. You add that up, this is a V. 
our look, about a negative 20% Q2 followed by a plus 20% Q3. Q4, we're back to normality. Is it a recession? I don't even know. It's hard to say. The two quarters of negative economic growth is something a reporter made up, not the MBER. They have a more complicated definition of what a recession is. They probably will call it one, but again, it doesn't look like any past recession because again, it's going while very deep, it's also going to be incredibly short. This is just not a great recession type scenario. Yes, there'll be some moderate upticks in debt distress. The stock market's gonna be all over the map. But when you think about long-term issues such as real estate, there's no reason in the world that this is gonna change any of those dynamics. Now, we also have to be a little bit humble. We all realize this is a relatively new circumstance. And while we're still positive this is gonna be a sharp V, there's a couple things to think about. Those wild cards, those little issues. For example, second round of outbreaks not driven by the same virus coming back by some sort of major mutation. Yeah, that could be a problem. Got to keep an eye on that. Again, I think it's low, low probability, but we'll see. What's the global situation? Glo global supply chains are disrupted all over the place. That could, this could be more severe for the global economy necessarily for the United States. We have to pay attention to that. We know there's going to be disruption in retail and restaurants, not because this virus and the shutdowns are so bad, but because these sectors were already stressed in the first place. Retail because of the inter internet, restaurants because there were too many of them. So with that in mind, yes, you're gonna fast forward a lot of bankruptcies, look for some problems here. Again, not big enough to really slow down the recovery, but it's gonna be out there, it's gonna be in the news, and you're gonna be seeing some of that, again, because they were already under distress. One of the things we also need to take away from this is this. This really isn't all that bad of a situation. So why are the financial markets in complete utter chaos? Well, a couple of reasons, a couple of things to think about. First of all, the financial markets have been all over the map for the last decade. January of last year, the stock market was down 20%. Within a few months, it was at a record high level. And by January of this year, it was pretty clear the stock market was in a major bubble with the third highest PE ratio ever in the history of the stock market. That's a mess. <laughs> Why aren't regulators waking up to the fact that there's something severely wrong in US financial markets? These are supposed to be the shock absorber for the US economy. Instead, they're turning into shock ex expanders. We need to get in, figure out why the markets are acting so chaotically, and figure out how to regulatory fix it. We have to do it now before the financial markets create their own chaos, their own crises when they don't need to exist. Yes, it's gonna be a little longer for entertainment and travel. That's something to keep an eye on. And last but not least, remember, state and local governments and federal government they're going to get whacked by this. Um, they don't have a lot of leeway. The federal government has a massive amount of debt already. We have issues out there, how it shakes out on that front, we have to pay attention to. So yes, bits of the economy, but overall, we continue to think this looks like a V, it's gonna be a V. Um, and, and I think that most of that panic and chaos in the press is just that, hyperbolic panic and chaos. So wrapping it up, be strong, don't let the pessimists get to you. Yes, this is a, a tough time to exist. To, to, I'm sorry, tough time to try and run a university, a tough time to try and run an economy. But with that in mind, again, sharp and short. There's no reason in the world that it should be anything else but. With that, uh, Tim, uh, if there's some questions, I'm, I'm happy to go ahead and take those and we can go from there. You bet, Chris, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, some great insight. Um, we do have some questions. I'll remind folks to enter your questions into the Q&A panel and uh, we'll get to uh, as many of those as we can. Um, first one is how uh, would you say COVID testing moving forward, is, how linked is that to the economy? Well, I think COVID testing is, is how we're going to make sure this thing is, is, is as best under control as possible, right? The more testing we have available to us, uh, the less it can create further disruptions and the little quicker the recovery is going to be. Again, whether we have a lot of testing or not enough testing, I still think a V, but the more testing we have, the better the V is going to be. Um, we need to get the testing into place. Obvious, one of the, one of the clearest things uh, that needs to be accomplished. I think we're getting there slowly but surely after really a, an abysmal start to the overall con uh, uh, situation. Truly abysmal. Sure. I, and, I, and I hear from our members all the time, especially the higher ed institutions, that 
uh, you know, travel budgets are cut and there's, uh, you know, uncertainty relative to even uh, just holding, holding classes and courses. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to what role you see higher education playing in uh, moving the economy forward? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting, right? So, so people always ask, I mean, aren't there some learning effects here, right? Um, and there is. There's a lot of learning going on right now. And learning does change the future at some level because we're a little smarter about things. For example, one big learning is, guess what? Pandemics are still with us, and we got to be a little smarter about this stuff and be a little more on top of it. Look, epidemiologists have been warning us for decades this was going to happen. I remember an article a couple of years ago where the guy said, it's not when, it's if. And I say, it's not if, it's when. We know this is going to happen, and here it is happening. Um, another big learning curve uh, is for businesses. And I think a lot of businesses are recognizing, you know, this online thing maybe isn't so bad. They might be a little willing to let people work from home one day a week. Uh, they might do a few more business meetings as opposed to using conference calls, using Zoom. And maybe, maybe that'll save some time and travel for folks, a little stress off our, our environment and the roadways as the case may be. But when it comes to universities and schools in general, I think we can also universally agree something else. There's been a lot of conversation about moving education online. Um, there have been a lot of states, including my state of California, put a lot of money into developing online education. And I will tell you that what most people are figuring out right now is online education doesn't work all that well. There's a lot of frustration from kindergarten to universities across the United States. Frustration by teachers, frustration by administrators, and guess what? Frustration by students. People don't want to do this stuff online. They want to be in the room. They want the interaction with their classmates. They want their interaction with their professors. This is an important lesson. Teaching in the way we need to teach intensively, it doesn't work well. Not, not yet, but not online. Maybe someday when we have virtual classrooms where it's everything three-dimensional and we could look around and we almost feel like we're there, maybe to work a little better. But I think we've all learned that the classroom is important and we need to invest in our campuses. We need to invest in that person-to-person -person experience. Um, so universities, you got a lot of work in front of you. It's not going to be that easy. You have to invest in your resources. You have to invest in local capacity. And this is not, you're not going to get this. I, my feeling is you're not going to get this cheap fix by putting stuff online. Yeah. And what, what, what about your, if you had uh, a message to tell uh, the graduating class from colleges and universities right now, we're in that season, right? So yeah. 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 And, and again, you're, job market. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say, I would like to tell you that um, don't feel, I don't feel alone. Um, I appreciate that in modern history, you've never seen anything like this. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, why me? Why now? Why does this happen happen? But go back in time. You know, humanity is beset by problems, whether it's a pandemic, which has existed for all of humanity, as far as we know, to, you know, what happened to people when their country was invaded by the Nazis in 1940, for example, right? Um, the world is not a certain place. Things happen, things change, unexpected events occur. Look at this as a challenging time, but a time to take away in terms of lessons learned, that the world isn't this uh, fixed, solid object, that, that we all have to be able to live in our feet a little bit and adapt and change and look for new, new ways forward. You know, um, I you know it sounds a little trite, but I've always said that what we teach people in college is less about facts and more about how to learn, right? I mean, it's how to be nimble, how to think through things, how to adapt when problems arise. Well, this is one of the best lessons you'll ever learn. This is about adaption, ad ad adaptation. And, um, and I know it's frustrating, but again, when you keep that in your back of your mind, I, I think it makes it all a little easier. So that said, how, how could we have been better prepared? Um, and and I, I mean, you can define that we as however you want. Uh, and, 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 uh, In other words, do I want to go on a political rant? <laughs> no, I, 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 I will not. <laughs> we, we as universities or we as society or we yeah, as, yeah. Uh, you know, economic developers, let's, let's maybe say economic developers and put a, put a, you know, small target on it. But, how yeah. have we been, been better prepared and how can we be prepared should that uh, one of those wild cards of the resur resurgence, uh, you know, how can we be more resilient, I guess, in the future, you know, considering that that could happen? 
Yeah, well, again, I think it's, it's about maintaining uh, our public health network, about having a sufficient social and safety net, while having uh, public budgets that are in balance. So when something surprising and bad does happen, we don't have to go even deeper into the hole. Um, there's lots of things to take away from this. And, and one of them, which I think is maybe most important, is listen to the experts, right? Because again, epidemiology has been telling us that this is gonna happen at some point in time forever. And yet we just go, yeah, 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 right? We have to listen to experts. We have to appreciate the expertise. Um, you know, when this first began, I, I, I made the mistake of calling this a black swan event. Now, black swan, of course, was is an economic terminology for some surprising thing. Uh, by the way, the roots of that are quite interesting. It's because Romans used to say, you know, that, that's, that's about as likely as a black swan because the Romans knew all swans were white until, of course, a European ended up in Australia and went, oh, my God, there's a black swan. Um, now, the reason I bring this up is there are numerous black swan type events out there. And that is, uh, for example, the idea of a major fiscal crisis. Macroeconomists have been talking about this forever. And we just kind of ignore them, kind of like we ignore those epidemiologists. Federal budget is important. It doesn't seem to be important in our time, um, but it is important. And I do worry that we are handing our children a debt legacy, which is again, immoral. It's not fair to them to have to, to clean up for us. We need to get our fiscal house in order for once and for all. Oh man, I was all over the map there. I'm not even sure what to take away from that particular That's rant good. and rave. That's good. Um, yeah. How and one you? last thing, there's one last lesson too. And that is while we're ignoring the experts who are telling us the real problems, how much attention are we paying to the screaming talking heads who dominate 24 hours news networks who don't have a clue? Mm -hmm. Their entire existence is to try and get you to pay attention to them. And the only thing they do is shout as loud as possible. When are we as people gonna be, start becoming smarter consumers of information? Mm -hmm. Gotta start. So regarding, you know, your topics and, and even some of the, the charts, I'm sure, you know, you guys created many of those, but where are you going for your resources? Uh, in terms of an outlook for the economy? Yeah. That's ours. This is all our data, right? I mean, it's all these, well, I mean, outside of the, some of the stuff like Goldman Sachs, I wish I had access to the data they do. Um, but for the most part, I would again argue that there's a couple things to really pay attention to here. One of them is how many of these people who are unemployed are claiming they're on temporary layoff. Now, again, they're not saying that because, you know, they feel like it. Uh, I think these people truly believe that. You got to pay attention to that. Another important statistic is absolutely initial claims for unemployment. Now, the reason that's important, because remember, employment is a lagging indicator. This time around, it was a leading indicator. It spiked and it's been coming down. If initial claim starts to go up again, it starts to accelerate again, that's dangerous because it's secondary effects and those are gonna be more important. So I'm watching those a lot. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, I'm paying attention to that savings rate. The savings rate for April will come out uh, towards the end of this month. And it will probably be the most important statistic we have because it goes back to that balance between pent up demand and of course, what I would call uh, people who are falling behind. And that's gonna be an important number. The higher that savings or lower that savings rate is, again, will tell us if it's more of a V or more of a U. Pay attention to those numbers. Um, how is it that 41%, so this is a question from Michigan in particular, but how is it that 41% of the Michigan population can't afford basic needs, rent, daycare, food, and et cetera? And that was before the pandemic. You know, what are the, what are the outlooks for, for places like that? Right, well, for, for off the bat, that the idea that 40% of any population can't afford basic needs kind of a preposterous assertion. And, and I'm not trying to be harsh here, but you know, we throw those statements around all the time, but when you actually think about it, it, they're kind of empty. What do you mean they can't? I mean, people have a great life in the United States. Most people have a great life. In fact, the average person in the United States or the vast majority of people in the United States enjoy significantly better life than anybody else in the world. So I'm not exactly sure how to interpret a question like that because that statistic is just sort of made up. We just randomly determine that some number is what people need to survive, even though guess what? They're surviving with a slower number than that. Mm -hmm. um, look, there's no doubt that 
some people are having a tough time right now. And that's why we have social safety nets. That's why we have unemployment insurance programs. That's why we have Medicaid. That's why we have food banks and food stamps. We should applaud the systems we have to help those people through these tough times. And they're working. I think that they are helping us through these tough times. So uh, back to hired institutions, uh, there's you know many of our members and, and those on the call are state funded institutions who are seeing yeah. public funding cliff looming closer. So how, yeah. uh, uh, how to leverage, uh, how can you leverage the survival of public higher education uh, without burdening students by placing more cost on them through tuition? Well, there's a couple of things you need to do. First of all, like most public schools need to start building that alumni network and, and, and doing what a lot of the more private sector schools do. Um, but at the same time, I think that um, what most private sector schools do as well is remember, when you think about the tuition at Harvard or tuition at Yale, the, the headline number is astonishingly high, but they really only charge that to the most well-heeled students among them. In a lot of ways, the idea for a public institution is being a little more clever in terms of how you charge people tuition so that, yeah, you can get a little extract a little bit more from those students who can afford a little bit more, while those students who really are having a tough time have that opportunity to uh, uh, still attend your institution. Um, look, public schools have been uh, an enormous resource to this economy, to this country. They've been an enormous resource to me. I mean, I did my PhD in my undergrad state school. So I have phenomenal respect for the systems. They need to take their lesson from those private sector company, uh, schools that have managed to build up systems that allow them to provide a first class education without necessarily burdening their more, more at risk uh, students. And, you know, I, and your comments about the, uh, you know, taking things online, you know, and students not wanting to survive there, I think that, you know, it's an important point to make that that's based on those that aren't traditionally online, that there are some online institutions that are doing it and doing it well and providing a service. Um, is there anything to be learned there? Um, <laughs> from those, from sorry, I, I, I was reading I got, we got a nasty comment here. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> Not sure what she's upset about, but okay. <laughs> I will try to give you your 53 minutes back. I'm sorry. Ask that, we'll ask that question one more time. Yeah, so, so there are some, uh, you know, your, your comment about, you know, kind of losing, students losing their, uh, their outlook uh, and, and how, they're, um, how they're advancing learning uh, through online. They, you know, they don't want to participate online. We're seeing that teaching needs to be in person. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are some, institutions that are doing well, uh, and yeah, I, I, look, well you know, for I, a while. And, yeah. I think there are certain circumstances it can work, right? I think you have a more adult population, depending on the type of, 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 of learning that's going on, the type of subject matter. I think it can work in certain circumstances. And in some cases, you don't have a choice. You're dealing with truly remote students who just don't have an opportunity to get to a classroom. Well, in the best case scenario, that may be all you can do. But my point, I think, and, and this is a person who's taught in the classroom, who appreciates the value of the interaction, as much as I've gotten used to these kind of forums. Um, when I first time I did one of these, I was really uncomfortable. And now here I am a few weeks later, and I'm amazed by how I can stare at a screen like this and give, a, I think, a reasonable speech. Jennifer comment to the opposite <laughs> uh, about, you know, about what's going on out there today. But again, when you're talking about a 15 or 10 week experience where you're really delving into the depth of topics in ways that, um, that these sort of short talks just can't get into, I really believe that you just have to be in the room with people. You got to have that person to person connection. So, uh, how are you taking into consideration, I know we only have a few minutes, just a few more questions. Sure. How are you taking into consideration uh, coming cuts in state and local spending? Uh, as stated, it's 17% of GDP into account for your projections. Well, state and local spending, I think, is what they're saying is 70% of GDP. I'm not sure it's quite that high. But it's 17. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I will tell you this. I mean, again, I said that state and local budgets are going to get whacked right now. Um, now, the thing about state and local governments is they have tools, uh, if you will, to dodge uh, bullets. We saw that through the Great Recession in a lot of ways. Um, they will avoid cuts as much as they can by, by moving things around and, and trying to
to keep afloat till revenues come back. Um, it's got to be part of the hit. There's no doubt about it. But again, remember, it's uh, we still see sharp and short. And while we think, for example, we did some studies here in California, and what, what we're talking about here is about a, a two fiscal year hit to revenues for local and state governments um, for the current fiscal year and next fiscal year. Uh, this year, pretty much the end of, coming up to the end of this year, all growth minus a little bit. The following year, basically flat yet again. It is an apocalypse. It's not like a massive decline in revenues over a long period of time. It is going to be a hit. There are a lot of plans that state and local governments are probably putting into place that they're going to have to back away from. But we don't see any massive layoffs necessarily having to inflict the system. And, you know, while it's it's no doubt much different than the 2008 financial crisis. One of the underlying barriers to economic growth, which is consumer confidence, and that's unlikely to rebound sufficiently until there's a vaccine found. Well, again, I'd be cautious about that because I can tell you right now that if you look at consumer confidence as a predictor of economic growth, of a predictor of consumer spending, it doesn't work. Um, even a few basic indicators make that just fall out as statistically unimportant. Uh, and a classic case of that is what happened after September 11th. Um, September 11th, of course, a horrible tragedy. You know, thousands of people died. It, it, it substantially changed U.S. history uh, globally. Um, it, it's certainly traumatic for anybody to watch those towers come down. Consumer confidence completely collapsed. October of that year, the month after the World Trade Center came down, we saw one of the greatest accelerations in consumer spending we've ever seen. It was, it was odd. Consumer confidence went down and consumer spending went through the roof. It was like everybody went out and spent money because they were upset. So while I appreciate what you're saying, it doesn't statistically follow that that's going to impede the recovery. All right, we're coming up on the end of the hour, so uh, I wanna have a minute to Thank you. Uh, My pleasure. For, for being with us today. And, uh, and if you want some of these slides, if you want to take a look, they're at beaconecon.com. They'll be there to uh, download and take a look at. And uh, well, I hope uh, other people enjoyed their uh, 59 minutes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and your contact information is on your website as well. So Absolutely. That's right. To reach out, please, please do so. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, uh, take care. Stay safe. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye.